don't say goodbye and hello. <laughs> I'll say hello too. Now we go on. So uh, let me repeat that sentence as soon as I can find my cursor. That I am confining myself, says DK, entirely to the theme of the unfoldment of consciousness, of meaning, and of significances. First, we have to agree that there is such a factor of consciousness and begin to be aware of changes in it. I think uh, through awareness of change, a factor is isolated, is located. Through changing conditions, we are able to focus on that in which the conditions change. Meaning is a question of relationship within the context of the whole. Significance uh, has a certain relation to the progression of the uh, will, the intention of the will, the forward drivingness of will. So there is an objective, there is a destiny, and significance of anything has to do with its contribution to the fulfillment of that destiny, not just its place within a whole, which is meaning, but that which it um, points to as part of the fulfillment of the intended destiny of the being whose purpose is being enacted through the driving will of that same being. So this uh, book is not written in terms of practical effects, although it's interesting how many very practical observations, first-hand observations, DK does include as he discusses the nature of the people who are found uh, strongly uh, influenced by various signs and planets. So he is confining himself entirely to the theme of the unfoldment of consciousness, of meaning, of significances, and of the response of this conscious entity, which is uh, the soul. Soul on its own plane, and the soul in incarnation. The response of this conscious entity to the many influences and vibratory impacts to which it is subjected on account of its being an integral part of other and greater lives. So what happens in the greater lives happens to the constituents of those lives. And the question is here, how do we, the consciousness, respond to the impacts which are uh, available to us be because of our um, uh, of our inhering in greater forms in which energies uh, are pervading. A little awkward, but that's the idea. So this is my frequent injunction given because the activity of reflection is a potent means to revelation. He did tell us if we want to increase love in our life, then reflect on love. So we could almost say that reflection contributes to the increased expression of quality. And uh, we should not think that we are wasting our time when we silently enter into reflection because it is, in a way, truly progressive action, whereas the third-ray busyness in the world of activity may simply be repetitious and may not be advancing the consciousness at all, though it may be advancing what we call manifestation. So the big question is, to what do we as units of consciousness respond and what is the manner of our response, the degree of sensitivity of our response? Uh, is this increasing? Can we handle more than heretofore we have handled? 
can we, like the initiate, expand our registration to register many more vibratory impacts than we could as disciples, just as as disciples we expanded our registration of impacts over what was possible to us when we were aspirants. And so it goes. There has been an increase in sensitivity constantly over so many years. I'm sure we'd all be appalled at how very insensitive we were, let's say, 10 million years ago, relatively speaking. When perhaps uh, people such as ourselves were occupying what have been called huge tabernacles of clay, the forms upon this planet had been progressively sensitized so that more and more of the inner soul nature and of pure being itself can make its way through, pervade, permeate the denser fields of relationship and thereby contribute more towards the expression and redemption, well, the redemption of the, of the constituents of those fields. When, when uh, soul and spirit are truly safely present in matter, what we call matter usually, then the response of matter will be much more rapid and the elevation, the intended elevation, much facilitated. So I've sought to bring the above thoughts to your attention. Oh, see, think about this. You know, he's um, DK. Let's uh, go up here. What is he doing? DK is discussing sensitivity. One of the one of the main Leo themes and sensitivity to soul and the preparation of the form so that there may be increased sensitivity to soul and so that we may not be shut off in a darkened room which is so often the symbol used in the old commentary for a benighted consciousness isolated insensitive unavailable to the higher energies opaque not translucent not transparent this is about sensitivity and the acute sensitivity required of the Leo person as he gets to know himself more and more and thus gets to know the world. Socrates, uh, the Delphic Oracle, you know, know thyself and thou shalt know the world. This is a Leo idea. And uh, Socrates is said to have said that, uh, and it is uh, in the Delphic Oracle. Know thyself, and thou shalt know the world. So I've sought to bring uh, the above thoughts to your attention because the sign we are now studying is one in which the theme of self-consciousness lies open to the investigator. There's so many things in the field we call the content of consciousness, uh, of the many things within the contents of consciousness. And let's say the self is one of them. And we can learn, in the Hall of Ignorance, we can learn all about the environment but our consciousness can be so thoroughly extroverted that we know learn nothing about the one who's doing the learning. Well, in Leo, there's kind of a reflexive consciousness caused. An examination comes back to the examiner. And all the different levels that are contained within the examiner, the, the book with 10,000 pages, the many pages long forgotten, some of them maybe with just a scrawl on them, other pages uh, intricately organized and profound. So we have to leaf through those pages in our examination of ourself, which one day will be thorough, just as it was in the light of Asia for the Buddha as he sat under the Bodhi tree and saw 
his previous uh, incarnations, apparently with great clarity. The many pages will lie open to us. And we will see what we have been, what we are, what we will be. It should be quite a revelation. With examples of many examples of failure, I'm sure, and some of success. Otherwise, we would not be to the point of mind and of psychological sensitivity we have now achieved. It's been a long, slow building process, and I'm sure that there will be a great appreciation in our minds for the bene benevolence of the divine plan, the beneficence of the divine plan and of the one who conceived the plan, of the ones who conceived it, and of the purpose behind it all. Mass consciousness in Cancer gives place to individual consciousness in Leo. So, let's just say that in mass consciousness, where is the center? Where is the center? The sense of center or of the experiencer is very limited. But we have to begin somewhere, feeling and experiencing the instincts uh, just as everybody else does, without much sense of a well-formed or unique identity, a distinctive identity, with Leo, there is the movement towards distinguishing oneself and one's qualities from everybody else. We can call this lower egoism if we want, but it is, it is a necessary stage to um, eventually align with those high qualities of spirit, which we, under the will of God, are obliged to bring through into manifestation if the purpose is to be expressed. So out of the mass, out of the tribe, out of what everybody else is thinking and doing and how everybody else is reacting, out of the mass are herd, it's an animal term, isn't it? Let's look at that. An animal term, it sounds kind of uh, bovine, <laughs> or, you know, it relates to the unintelligent group uh, moving this way and that together, emerges the self-sufficient unit which becomes increasingly aware of its oneness, its aloneness. This is uh, the emergence of the self-sufficient unit. This is a Leonian emergence. It's aloneness, it's isolated attitude, as the one in the center of its small cosmos. This we call, uh, call this personality sometimes, or the centralization of the consciousness of the lower ego. When DK uses the term ego, it's so often meant uh, to relate to the higher mind or even to the triad. Uh, psychologists who are more familiar with personalities than with souls refer to ego as the personality. It's the sense of normal personal identity. It's what we think we are. It's our own observation of ourself, our distinctness. Uh, but from the Atlantean mass must emerge the Aryan collection of distinct and distinctive lower egos who may or may not get along, at least until soul, the unitive energy of the soul under Jupiter and Venus begins to affect the lower ego and reveal to it its own limitations. It's always uh, striking to me that on the chessboard, the king is such a powerless figure unless it is in relationship with its subjects who can represent its intentions and protect it. 
but the king can so easily get cornered if its relationships fail. And, you know, what's uh, quite astonishing is how powerful the queen is. Huh? So there's a huge lesson in chess, and I think it reflects the societies in which it was originated and uh, developed. So there is the emergence of the self-sufficient unit. Not just led, not just following what everybody else does, not predictable. Uh, and a certain, what can we say, a certain uh, unpredictable individuality uh, emerges. With the mass, with the herd, you can pretty well tell what the response is going to be. From the distinctive unit, it is more difficult to ascertain. So this attitude of the one in the center is so very Leonian. It's a first ray attitude. And Leo is a major first ray sign. This attitude continues to develop and to become emphatic and dynamic. A great emphasis is placed upon being the one and power issues from this one. Now, DK did discuss some psychopathologies according to the rays and the first and fifth ray type. And when I think of those, I think of Leo because that sign above all has the first and fifth ray can make itself so isolated as to become untouchable. He talks about the psychopathology of one and five then of 2, 4, and 6, and then of 3 and 6. Three different modes of abnormal psychological expression. So, emphasis upon this isolated one at the center and the power issuing from it, um, these grow over time into that stage of the Dominance and dominating personality, which uh, DK discusses as functioning over a period of three, seven, or even eleven lives. What must he be able to investigate to see the way the human being functions through the various stages of its growth? We are indeed, with respect to the true psychology, in a darkened room. We have to emerge from this darkened room. Gradually, I suppose, learning what the superiors are teaching and then learning to apply that teaching to ourselves. So this attitude uh, continues to develop and to become emphatic and dynamic. I use these words with intent. He wants us really to focus on the is a self-emphasizing individual, a powerful self-emphasizing individual. Okay. Oh, let's get that correct. And I don't know why it didn't give me red the way I wanted, but there it is. So sometimes he calls attention to the words he used because he wants to make a real impact on our consciousness. And to become emphatic and dynamic, leading to a pronounced egocentric consciousness. And there he uses ego in the lower sense, one of the rare times that he does. Leading to the pronounced egocentric consciousness of the selfish, intelligent man and to the ambitious display of selfless power of the man who desires place and position. We certainly see that in the world today of celebrities and those who have come before the consciousness of humanity. But this is an excellent um, description of what we could call um, the attitude of the egocentric man. Ambitious to display his own selfish power and who desires place and position. It 
so interesting. These words, place and position, it deals with time-space illusions. Uh, it deals with a hierarchical consciousness and the ambition to always be at the top of uh, one's own particular hierarchy. It shows a lack of perspective of the larger uh, context and of one's own true magnitude. To the egocentric person, the ego occupies a great space in the field of consciousness. It has to shrink and become almost as nothing for a true planetary, systemic, or even cosmic perspective to develop. But eventually, um, eventually, the time comes when the nature of the fixed cross begins to dawn upon the consciousness of the man, and the influence of Aquarius, the polar opposite of Leo, begins to, bal uh, begins to balance that of Leo. Uh, so uh, we always rely upon the sign opposite our, let's say, sun sign or rising sign to balance our tendencies. Now the point opposite the sun is that of the uh, heliocentric earth which gives us the position of the influence of the monad in the chart if the individual is such that that monad can influence. So it's almost as if uh, the monadic energies that are available in an incarnation can balance those of egocentricity. The sun sign promotes personality consciousness and makes us loom unduly large within our own field of consciousness. The monad is the consciousness of the whole and as that consciousness is entered reduces the large ego more and more towards the point until that point is relinquished and disappears as if it were nothing. So um, the ego, lower ego, is always bruising itself, rubbing itself against the environment and causing friction and irritation. Um, and Master Moria tells us about wearing away irritation through cosmic perception. The closest thing we have to cosmic perception uh, is derived from the awareness of the monad, which in any one incarnation, if we are ready, comes through the point opposite the sun sign. This is one of the new revelations in esoteric astrology given in some papers uh, to the discipleship group which have been uh, emerging over the last decade or so, or two decades. Those who had those papers, I think, didn't make very much of them or do very much of them or see what the implications were, but that was an earlier time, you know, 70 or 80 years ago, 80 years ago. So um, the details of esoteric astrology gradually emerge, a fuller and fuller picture is given, and we see more and more intelligently our place in the whole and can work more scientifically at the elevation um, of our consciousness <clears throat> towards its possible spiritualization. So that is what the fixed cross gives us, a balancing. We know that if we stand at the center of the fixed cross, or any cross, we are in a position to take advantage uh, of all the four energies which come from the four directions and to unify them, synthesize them and in a way rise to a pyramidal point above them which is the point of synthesis for all of them. 
So we cannot maintain our lopsided perspective once we really uh, step upon the fixed cross and begin to function more in response to the inclusive soul consciousness. It's just that every sign really needs its polar opposite as a balancing factor, and we should uh, think of the ways that the sign opposite our sun sign, for instance, or perhaps opposite our rising sign, can be introduced into our life to create a wiser expression of energy, a less distorted uh, and uh, overly emphasized expression of energy. Then there comes the gradual shift of the focus of attention away from the one who stands alone. This is the giving up of personality consciousness. You know, you see some really big egos in the lower sense on the world stage and you wonder how it is that as they look at the world they loom so large in their own eyes. It really is a failure of perspective. And I suppose Leo is a sign which in the early days uniquely uh, gives this failure of perspective or inclines towards this failure of perspective. Many are the reductions of lower ego which must occur painfully I suspect before a person begins to get a real sense of proportion between what he thinks he is and what the world is. Obviously this is uh, mirrored for us in astronomical discoveries. We begin with a kind of egocentrism which is uh, entirely geocentric. Everything revolves around the earth, absolutely everything. Eventually, the true sun is seen to be elsewhere, perhaps the soul. And eventually, even that is seen to be revolving around still greater centers and so forth. It's a real decentralization, which the Leo type uh, needs, and of which, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the need, he may be totally unaware at first. It's a stage we all must pass through, the stage of uh, self-importance. It is a limitation. So then comes the gradual shift of the focus of attention away from the one who stands alone. Just checking, you know, to make sure that things are on when they should be on and off when they should be off. Um, the gradual shift of attention away from the one who stands alone to the environing group. I am that. And an equally important shift away from selfish interests to group requirements. So we can call, call this the Aquarianization. Yes, Aquarianization. I'd like to make that. Every once in a while you see a word that it would be good to use again and you want to save time by having a code for it. So this gives uh, concisely the objective which is attained by the man upon the fixed cross. It's the, in many ways we can simply call it the shrinking of the lower ego until it becomes eventually the relinquished point. And then it can be truly said, and one can identify with what is said, that God is a intelligible sphere whose uh, center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. I think it's kind of a mathematical formulation. It may have been Pascal one of those uh, more 
uh, spiritually inclined mathematicians. The effect of that cross is to bring light through Taurus and also through Leo, the will to illumine, and liberation through Aquarius. This can be clearly seen if we contrast the energies of the four arms of the cross as they demonstrated by the man both before and after the long uh, and drastic experience upon the cross. So we're going to contrast the energies of the fixed cross and we're going to remember, is it on page 143 that other things are said here about the fixed cross? Yes, it is. Okay, so we want to keep this handy because this description, these these uh, four descriptions <clears throat> give the result of the work that is done by the uh, individual upon the fi uh, fixed cross and the reverse wheel. So we want to be aware of, uh, for the mutable cross, page 119 and following, and for the fixed cross. We have 143 and also here. Now, why can't I find a page number? Is it 294? No, it is 293. And also this page, 293. <clears throat> so Taurus is the bull of desire, but also the light of aspiration and knowledge the light of aspiration. It has so much to do with the type of enlightenment which is associated with the uh, Eastern spiritual experience. The highest form, we're told, of aspirational idealism is existing in Taurus. So, the aspiration towards illumining knowledge, I would say. The aspiration towards illumining knowledge. Leo is the lion of self-assertion, the king of beasts, but also the light of the soul, which is the, uh, the light revealed by the sensitive consciousness. Scorpio is the deceiver. Let Maya flourish and deception rule, the agent of deception, uh, deliberately availing the truth through the three expedients of illusion, glamour, and Maya, but also the light of liberation, uh, which is also called the, <laughs> it's not called that, <laughs> light of day. So it's not liberation itself. We have to combine these forms of light uh, with the kinds of light described in the Cancer chapter on page 329 and 330. So combine, excuse me, <clears throat> these forms of light with the light as described in the Cancer chapter. Uh, pages 329, 330 or so. This is important. Light of liberation. Because it is, uh, in the case of Scorpio, it is the light of intuition which actually liberates and reveals Illusion, glamour, and Maya for the uh, vacuous, for their vacuity, if I can say that, for <clears throat> their vacuity. There seem, seem to be really nothing, nothing real, seem to be nothing real and nothing worthwhile. And so, attachment to them 
is dropped. And their power over the consciousness dies in the light of liberation. Okay. And before and after the chalice of self-service. Oh, this is so good. Uh, I am astonished as I mm, look at the scene of American politics. I guess is the kind of politics I'm most familiar with. And I see how many selfish Aquarian idealists there are. I don't want to name names here, but a little research will reveal this. People so blinded by their own ideal that they don't see how selfish these ideals are. The selfishness of these ideals is concealed from them. I'm thinking of several players right now who are really contributing to the disintegration of the fabric of American society, who are convinced Aquarian idealists serving themselves and their own clubs or classes. regardless of the whole. Now you know how it is. Aquarius is supposed to reveal the whole through increasing universalization of consciousness, but this is not the case. It's only a part, only a group that is like themselves and uh, an elite that is not the whole at all. But eventually this gives place to the light of the world. Um, how was it put? very beautifully. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> the light that shines on earth across the sea. The light that shines on earth across the sea. I suppose the etheric physical plane and the astral plane are involved here. This is the light which ever shines within the dark. I suppose the Aegean stables and cleansing with its healing rays that which must be purified until the dark is gone. So when there is purification, the light can break forth. We're getting rid of the opaque dirt, the dirt which uh, blocks the radiation of the light within the form. The light that shines on earth across the sea. Hmm. So the light of the world um, is present. The light of the world is present in Aquarius. Uh, but also the Christ as Pisces and the Buddha as Taurus said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Yeah. So a great light, distributive, distributively available for all. The fixed cross is the cross of light, and also the cross of soul. And this means, as we know, that the soul is light. Certainly that's one of its aspects. The soul is light. And playing through this cross all the time and emanating from Leo are the fires of God. It's the only fire sign on the fixed cross, of course, so fire would emanate from it. The fires of God, cosmic, solar, and planetary, this is why um, we are told that the Leo type on the fixed cross experiences fiery pain. 
fires there, and when we bring together the high and the low, the low will experience pain while the high experiences delay. So emanating from Leo are the fires of God, cosmic fire, solar fire, planetary fire, producing purification, the burning away of obstructions, the intensification of the light, and the eventual revelation to the purified man who stands in the light. So what is produced here through the fires of God? Come purification, intensified light, and revelation. This the sun can provide, this Leo can provide, and light reveals the nature of reality on the fixed cross. From Aries, uh, the origin here, at least as far as we are concerned, in our local cosmos, from Aries comes cosmic fire. From Sagittarius comes planetary fire. Interesting that Earth is the esoteric ruler of that sign, and from Leo comes solar fire. So notice here the three rays with which the uh, three fire signs are identified. Aries with the first ray, Leo with the second, Sagittarius with the third. This is uh, not necessarily, these are not necessarily the rays which are said to pour through the constellations, but we can see the identification, the position of the fire signs with respect to the rays of aspect. Each of these purifies. Each of these fires clears the way by burning for the expression of the three divine aspects. So clearing the way by burning, burning in different ways. The aspect of spirit, uh, the way for that aspect is cleared by the fires of Aries. The way of expression for the aspect of soul is cleared by the burning uh, which Leo induces and I suppose the, purific the purificatory fires of Sagittarius are working in the body to clear the way for the best expression of the energies of the body. We see that in Sagittarius with its strong body consciousness, Leo focusing on the individual identity and Aries on the great macrocosmic picture on the one. These are all different burning grounds. The impurities of the body have to be burned away. The misidentifications uh, that surround the soul and its uh, sense of being uh, less than it is. Uh, the sense of limited ego, the sense of ahamkara has to be burned away. And the fires of Leo contribute to that burning, presumably. And then uh, the part cannot disguise itself as the whole. The true and free spirit within any form or pattern of energies has to be identified. Pure being has to be identified, we're told about Aries, in connection with the third degree and with the entry into pure being or spirit. So we are, again, clearing away uh, identification with the part and leaving the pure being which is the essence of all that we perceive as the whole. And uh, Aries burns away partiality. It burns away the inability to see the whole picture uh, and it burns away number, if you will. Aries is the one, 
And from the two and following numbers come all the complexity which masquerade as reality. And Aries reduces all these, uh, reduces number, all number to one. to the number one, and reduces all complexity to essential being. Uh, Leo uh, prevents uh, lower ego from masquerading as ego. The fires of Leo prevent the lower ego from masquerading as the true self or ego. So Leo is always detaching. The fires of Leo, fires of Leo, help the uh, consciousness detach from lesser notions of identity. With uh, Sagittarius and its mobility, uh, there is true fitness. And the impediments, the encumbrances, the impurities that don't belong in the body are exercised away. And uh, great, uh, the, the, the full potential of the body is revealed athletically. Always stretching beyond what it normally can do. Uh, you're getting out of Sagittarius what's called uh, one's, whoops, uh, interesting athletic term, one's personal best stretching, going beyond the limited horizon, uh, bringing physical excellence, vital. So, this is all about Agni Yoga, isn't it? The Yoga of Fire. So such is the basis, really, the scientific basis and astrological basis of the Yoga of Fire. Let's call it Agni Yoga. Master Moria, who is bringing forward the Yoga of Fire, initially through Helena Rorick, um, seems to be identified with the sign uh, Aries. He says, if you wish to remember me, remember me on March 24th. Hmm. And... Um, I wouldn't be surprised, King, that he has been in so many instances that he has a very strong Leo identification, too, of the first race signs. He loves fire. I don't see him so much connected with Capricorn, the other first ray sign. It's almost like Aries and Leo are the two major signs for him. As such is the scientific basis of the yoga of fire. Yeah, King Solomon, King Solar Man. It's almost like he would have the sun in Leo and Aries rising, something like that. The different masters do have a kind of sun sign and rising sign which seems to be preserved over time as identifying what they are. So as we know, you know, Master K.H. with his... Uh, sun in Gemini, Pisces rising, maybe the Buddha, sun in Taurus... Pisces rising, maybe, although he is also called the lion. I speculate about the Christ. Uh, maybe Sun and Libra, uh, Pisces rising, or the other way around. With DK, what would it be? Sun and Taurus, Gemini rising. Speculations, of course. To be confirmed, uh, you have to reach out speculatively guided by the sense of what may be, intelligent reasoning, maybe touching a little on the intuition, and then this can be confirmed and the truth be ascertained later, but to stretch speculatively in this way is an invocation 
of the confirmatory intuition. Or perhaps it invokes the one who knows and can confirm. So this is the scientific basis of the yoga fire applied by the fully self-conscious man to the reflection of the three divine aspects in the three worlds. So um, the yoga of fire is applied to the personality by the soul identity, the fully self-conscious man, to the personality. I said to the personality. These are the three modes of divine expression in the three worlds, the modes of spirit, soul, and body. Soul and body. Such is the significance of the fact that it will be found that before the door of initiation lies the burning ground. So, clearer and ever clearer and colder burning grounds. So these fires uh, produce a clarification of perception. Yes? These fires produce clarification of perception. There are um, burning grounds which admit to a uh, clearer utilization, a more intelligent utilization of the body form and of personal understanding. Sagittarius is so identified with the lunar lords which uh, in their composite nature produce the personality. The burning ground of, uh, induced by Leo produces a clearer sense of uh, spiritual identity of the higher ego, ever revealing and clarifying what the higher ego is. The burning ground induced by Aries introduces the being into the essence or pure being. Every burning ground empowers and reveals. I want to say that. That uh, every burning ground both empowers and, uh, and reveals. Such is the significance of the fact that it will be found that before the door of initiation lies the burning ground induced by three fire signs. Obviously, uh, Aries, with Uranus as the hierarchical ruler, relates uh, to what has been called the final burning ground. But then, what is final? Maybe final for the human being, as a human being, but certainly not final in any sense with respect to to planetary, solar systemic, cosmic opportunity. So there's a burning ground, and obviously burning grounds require fire, and the fire signs have to be involved. Burning grounds require fire. So the fire signs must be involved. The Leo subject treads this burning ground with will and self-effacement. Well, will, of course, does come through Leo strongly, as it does come through Aries. But self-effacement, what is the purpose of self-effacement? Purpose of self-effacement, in terms of what the Leo individual must achieve, is the, well, I want to say a word like, uh, de-authentication, <laughs> the rendering of the lower ego less and less authentic. 
These are a word that embodies that. The rendering of the lower ego less and less authentic. Uh, the word authenticity has to do with that which the self really is, AU. It's the symbol for gold and the symbol for the self. What is the authentic self? So, uh, self effacement rids us of the inauthentic selves, many of them, and eventually reveals the true self. So it is not the true self which is being effaced, but false selves. So Leo uh, throws us onto a burning ground where we have to discover what we really are. Maybe, maybe every burning ground uh, has elements of all three fire signs involved in it. But probably they drop away like stages of the rocket until we're left only with uh, Aries as we're entering the realm of cosmic fire. When um, he, the Leo subject, has reached full self-consciousness and mental integration, and when he has attained personality effectiveness, then he treads it, undeterred by pain and member on the fixed cross. We have fiery pain associated with Leo. So there is a deliberation, strength, uh, a mind that knows itself and is intelligent and positive to the environment, an effective uh, personality able to manifest its will, what it intends, then with resolve, he treads it undeterred by pain and produces uh, humility. This produces true humility in the Leo subject. And with humility comes a uh, realization of true identity, which is finally, I am that I am, or I am that and that am I. Not just I am, not just I am that, but the rounded out, inclusive sense of what one really is. I am that I am, I am that and that am I. So without humility, without humility, without uh, self-effacement, there is no revelation of the true self. And this it is uh, Leo's intention to achieve. Revelation of the true self and rulership. So, revelation of the true self, that's the will to illumine, and the rulership of all lesser uh, factors in the energy system by that true self. And once the individual has attained uh, real effectiveness within the human kingdom, then rulership over the lesser factors within humanity by the true self, which he represents, which is not his personal self at all, but which is the greater encompassing being. And this greater encompassing uh, being includes all these lesser selves that must be ruled temporarily until they understand that they are identified with the ruler. A little thought will make it apparent to you why the sun is the ruler of all the three conditions of Leo, exoteric, esoteric, and hierarchical. Um, the sun, the symbol of identity. And, you know, in Leo there are these uh, three phases of identity. So let me, um, at this point, uh, we have reached uh, the end of Esoteric Astrology 90, Section B, page, 
I always lose the page. 294, I guess. Page 294. And we will go on. Beginning of Esoteric Astrology 90, Section C, page 294. So, this is the end.